when they spoke out about it and they got tough times for it, they were willing to persevere. They were willing to just stick it out. No matter what, we're gonna do this thing. You know? So you have this, this idea of, you know, uh, uh, this progression that starts with conviction. It doesn't just happen with Islam, it happens with any ideology, by the way. Communists did this. You know, students in Tiananmen Square did this. The, the, the uh, Irani society did this when they revolted against the Shah. They did these, they, they believed something, they changed themselves, then they stood up for it and they, they spoke out about it, and when persecution came, they, they were patient persevering. This is the, you know, even among non-Muslim history, you find this is the revolution of Gandhi or whatever, right? Same idea. It is the same logical progression. But now we're taking this human, you know, and by the way, every time this kind of struggle happens, from a non-Muslim, we're not even talking from an Islamic point of view. From a non-Muslim point of view, those people who do this, who follow this process, are called heroes in history. They call them heroes in history. Whoever followed this procedure. This, you know, whether it's Martin Luther King, whether it's God, whoever it may be, they are looked upon as people who accomplish great things because they stuck to their beliefs and they stood up for justice no matter what the cost, right? And they are, their days are celebrated and their books written about them, monuments made about them. All of this is done because human beings deep down inside, no matter what culture, what tradition they come from, this is the process of decency that they respect. But then to imagine that you're fighting for something that in and of itself is incomplete. Most human beings, that they, even great human beings that struggled, whose struggles are commendable, they ended up struggling for something that in and of itself may be true, but it's only a small part of the truth. It's not the whole truth. And what Allah gave to us is the entire truth. So if they are willing to be convinced of something that is a small part of the truth, can you imagine a comparison between any of those activists and a believer? How much more convinced they, the believer should be? And if they are willing to change themselves, how much more willing should a believer be to change himself? And if they are willing to speak out about it, how much more willing should a believer be? And if they are willing to stand up against oppression, and still stick to their beliefs, and stand up for them, and speak the truth no matter what the cost, how much more of a right does Allah have on the believer? Sometimes the kuffar become an man, they can stand like that and compete. In sabr, this is why Allah says to us at the end of Surah Ali Imran, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, isbiru, wa sabiru, wa rabitu, wa taqullah. Those of you who claim to believe, have perseverance, then compete in perseverance. Meaning your enemies also have sabr. They have beliefs, and they act out on those beliefs, and no matter how hard it gets, we must persevere, we must move forward. They have this idea, you should compete with them in sabr, and remain consistent. وَرَابِطُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And you have something they don't have. Your taqwa will give you strength. They don't have taqwa, they will not give them strength. You will be able to beat them in this competition of sabr and perseverance. SubhanAllah. So, this, is, this was the overview that I wanted to share with you before we got into the tafsir of the surah itself. Now we begin with Ibn Ta'ala. First we begin with the ayah, وَالْعَصْرِ We already talked about the oath and its benefits. So we'll look at some of the opinions of the Salaf, including the Sahaba. We begin with Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says it refers to the ages, meaning different uh, ages of different nations, and the decades and centuries that have passed in human existence. In other words, when we said, Allah is talking about all of human history as proof that human beings are in loss, even today, that's what Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is saying in a nutshell. Ibn Kisan says al-asr refers to the night and the day. In other words, the human being should look at the nightfall and the daybreak and say, I am in loss. His, his, I, the state of emergency should be awakened every time the believer sees nightfall and every time he sees or she sees daybreak. Subhanallah. So we know it's easy to say, they said this and you move on. But when they said that, what is the consequence of that? What happens to our understanding of Qur'an and the way we look at the night and the day and the way we think about time? These are transformational things. You know, sometimes you find the salaf, they have, their tafsir is one word, two words. A whole ayah, their tafsir is one word. But if you think about that word, man, you realize how deep these people are, subhanAllah. They say a lot by saying a little. It takes us a lot more to say a little, but they say a little, but they end up saying a lot in, that, in those few words. They have these, this, this eloquence to them. Then, uh, similar, Hassan al-Basri says, this is from late day to sunset. This is the span, from late, I mean, begin, beginning of Asr all the way to sunset. Which is what I told you in ancient times, this was the time when there's a lot of hustle and bustle and emergency. 
Also it illustrates the end of an era Meaning a day is like an era It's the end of an era So what that implies as far as the human being is concerned is Know that your life is basically on the verge of death Know that you are on the verge, on the very edge of the end of your life Just like the sun is about to run out and darkness is about to fall This life of your world, your worldly life is about to run out And the, not, the death of it is about to fall upon you Think of it like that And then you, you will develop that state of emergency Qatada says it's the last part of the day anhu. Maqatil and Zamakhshari both actually commented This is Salat al-Asr Their interpretation of what Asr was Salat al-Asr And this is part of the the methodology of tafsir that says that when Allah swears by something, it must be something sacred. Right? That's one of the opinions about oaths. So in line with that methodology, they are saying, because Salat al-Asr is sacred, and how is it sacred? Allah calls it, you know, hafidhu ala salawatikum wa salat al-wasta. Right? You know, guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer. And what's the middle prayer? Al-Asr. Right? So al-Asr. That's, so Allah especially makes a point to talk about the Asr prayer, and why the Asr prayer? Again, tied to what society was doing at that time. They're, they're really, really busy at what time? Asr. That's when their meeting is. That's when the project is due. Then when the store is most busy. When the store is most busy, that's the hardest time to leave and make salah, isn't it? When the, project, when the meeting is going on, between exactly the times of... That's the, that's the time for them. When they have to break away from their dunya activities and go and make the salah. So Allah swears by that and the fact that they're not able to do that, they are in loss. SubhanAllah. Uh, then uh, in Abwa al-Bayan we find actually, first we'll go to Isra al-Tafasir, it says, Al-Dahru kulluhu. Al-Asr refers to time, all of it. And when we get to uh, linguistic analysis, we'll see the difference between the word Dahr and the word Asr. In Surah Al-Insan, Allah says, Ata ala al-Insani hinun min al-Dahri. So the word Dahr is used. Here the word Asr is used. So we'll understand the difference between these two words. But anyway, Aysa al-Tafasir says, Ad-Dahru kulluhu. Abwa al-Bayan says, Az-Zamanu kulluhu aw juz'un minhu. It is all time or a portion of time. And because of that portion of time, some of Fasirun even said, Al-Asr here is referring to the life of the Prophet wasallam, And they interpreted this because in another place in the Qur'an, Allah swears by the age of the Prophet. La umruka. He swears by the lifespan of the Prophet ﷺ. So they inferred from that that Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ is referring to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, the life of the last messenger that is being sent to all humanity, if they don't listen to him, they are definitely in loss. You see the connection? Because this is the dawn of, or this is the, pretty much the sunset of the life of this world. This is the last messenger. This is one of the greatest signs of the end of this world is the coming of the final messenger. And his life in and of itself is the biggest proof that human beings are headed for tremendous loss. So that's how they understood the word al-asr also. Then we'll look at az zujaj he says, وَرَبِّ uh, الْعَصْرِ That you know, this is actually a specific brand of a mufassirun, they did this. Whenever Allah Azza wa swears by a creation, they assume that the word Rabb is mahdhuf, it's understood before it. So he's saying, I swear by the master, the lord of time. So when Allah says, وَالْفَجْرِ they, These scholars will interpret it as, وَرَبِّ الْفَجْرِ Right? وَالضُّحَى وَرَبِّ الضُّحَى That's how they'll understand it. And they've done this consistently. A brand of scholars have done that consistently. But that's not the majority position. Nonetheless, I feel inclined to share it with you because this is within Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and it did exist in our history. Anyhow, finally, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, الزَّمَانَ أَلَّذِي يَقَعُ فِيهِ حَرَكَاتْ بَنِي آدَمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ وَشَرٍ this is all time in which the activities of the human being, of the children of Adam have occurred, whether they be good activities or they be bad activities. And by, by saying good and bad, what he's actually telling us is that the human beings overall, what have they done more of, good or bad? They've done more bad, hence they are in khusr. Time has illustrated that they had opportunity to do both, but they ended up doing more bad than good, so human beings have ended up in loss. Now we're going to look at a linguistic analysis of the word Asr itself. The word Asr comes from a verb, uh, the fi'l form is Asarahu or I'tasarahu. Both are used, ifti'al and the thulathi mujarrad is also used. Literally means he pressed it, he squeezed it, he drenched it. It's used for cloth that is drenched in water, and then you squeeze it like that and all the water comes out. That's how it's used. Also it can be used for fruits. You know when you squeeze a fruit and you get juice out of it, Arabic word for juice is Asir. And the verbal form is i'tasarahu or i'tasar al-burtuqal for example. I'tasar al-tuffah. In other words, he drew juice out of the, the apple. He drew juice out of... So to squeeze something, this is the first meaning. Asara thawba also, that to, he wrung water out of the garment. 
Then in the Quran we find وَفِيهِ يَعْصِرُونَ This is the mudari' form that's also used in the Quran. This is the interpretation of the dream by Yusuf a.s. And in it, you know, we find وَفِيهِ يَعْصِرُونَ And they also, they, they will squeeze juice, you know, how they, in the ancient times they used to press grapes, uh, stomp on grapes to make wine, or olives and other things like that. That's the word being used for squishing them. To, to actually bring the wine out of them or the juices out of them. The poet says, لَوْ كَانَ فِي أَمْلَاكِنَا أَحَدٌ يَعْصِرُ فِينَا كَالَّذِي تَعْصِرُ Had there only been among our leaders any one of them that spends or, or, or squeezes out from his wealth to give to us the way you give. In other words, this, this guy from one tribe, he goes to the leader of another tribe and he's trying to get some money out of him, right? So, and he thinks of money as, you know, you have so much, so what you give is just a little drop of droplets that you squished out of there. You have the core of it. So he says, I wish we had leaders that, you know, squished some of their wealth, so we could enjoy the droplets the way you give. So he's trying to butter him up, so he gives him some money, basically. That's what poetry is about. But you know, the benefit of poetry is, it gives us an insight on how the Arabs use these words. So we have a better understanding of how Allah Azza wa Jal is communicating with those ancient Arabs. Because it's their language, that's the, that's the language they spoke. Then we find asarat, interesting usage of verbs in, the Quran, in, in ancient Arabic. Asarat is used for a woman who has reached the dawn of her, of her youth. In other words, her youth is about to expire. Then they say about her asarat, the feminine form is used for her. Or if a girl reaches you know, maturity, they also use the word asarat, that she's matured into a woman. We find asarat is sahaibu, the clouds reached a point where they were to be squeezed by the winds. Literally the image the Arab would, it's very picturesque language. The clouds are imagined as like cloth that are squeezed and then the rain comes down. This is actually the imagery captured in the word in the Qur'an, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ Same root. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَاءً فَجَّاجَ Same root is used. The, 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 we set down from the clouds that are squeezed, meaning winds push them against each other and they get squeezed and then the rain comes down. That's the imagery that's been presented in these ayat. Then the asr, is, uh, this is something we mentioned before, but I'll tell you where it comes from now. A shihab writes this in uh, Sharh al-Shafi. He says, it's, Asr is a period of time, that, uh, a period of time in, during which someone you know passes away. And is also a period of time that you know in history where a nation became extinct, or a nation came to its end. Which is tied to what we were saying in the beginning. A state of emergency, and also the tragedy of human history. That's the two themes that are connected in the meaning of uh, Asr. Then finally, a couple more, مَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَصْرًا it, You know, when you say مَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَصْرًا it means I didn't do it at the time I was supposed to do it. So Asr is used as a time you are supposed to do something. By understanding that implication of Asr, what we're learning in وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانِ لَفِي خُسْرِ is human beings are in loss and the time to change the way they are supposed to do it is right now. This is the time to change immediately. That's one of the benefits of Asr in that word. Then جَاءُوا وَلَكِنْ لَمْ يَجِئَ لِعَصْرِ Similar meaning. He came but not at the time he was supposed to come. Or they came but not at the time that they were supposed to come. This, these are the meanings of just the word Asr. We are being asked to reflect on time that is dripping away from all of us. We can get lost in the technicalities and the grammatical analysis and the quotes of the Mufassirun, but let's think about how this applies to us. You and I have 24 hours in a day. How many of them are gone in sleep? How many of them are gone in work? How many of them are put into efforts for, to build our savings, dunya savings, pay the bills, but how much of it is being prepared for, so we can pay our bills in the akhirah? How much of it is going so that we can actually be ready to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal for that audit? There's the audit in tax season, then there's the ultimate audit that's coming in which we all have to stand for every single thing that we've done. These, you know, if I, I say this all the time. One of the benefits of this surah and using the word asr, because it's part of a day, is Allah is making us imagine our entire life as though it is how many? One day. That it's one day. If you can transform how you spend one day, basically you have transformed your life. Because you know, you know this already, many of you work full time, or are students full time, or you know, do you take care of the home full time? A lot of your days are exactly the same. There's a lot of routine. It's the same exact thing over and over and over again. So if you can bring a change to one part of your day, you've actually transformed one part of your entire life. You've transformed an entire part of your life. And that the time to make that change is running out. And my personal advice to you, this is not part of tafsir, just personal advice, we make changes to ourselves in Ramadan. 
We make those changes. We make changes for Eid. We make changes or we you know break from our schedule on special